it's 115. Naresh told me this was the best speaking spot of the conference because I said, man, I don't know if anybody's going to come after lunch on a Sunday at one, you know, 115. Naresh said, no, no, that's the best spot of the conference, right? So um, I think he was building my confidence, but, um, but we'll take it. I'll take it. But let's get everybody up because we got to clear just a little bit of space in our in our mind to cover this kind of heady topic, agile practices proven in high assurance environments, highly regulated, okay? So everybody stand up, okay? And do whatever you do, whatever you do to stretch a little bit and just feel like you got some room to get something in your, in your mind. We can fit a little bit more in. Uh, listen to this guy for an hour and then Scott comes back on so got a, somebody who's somebody who's good up here all right so clear just a little bit of space in your mind okay yep we're ready so I asked you to do that because I'm I'm really not the expert in this area right this is an expert talk they say it was on the expert track but you all are the experts you're the experts in your particular field not me okay so as we go through this today, I'm going to ask that you guys share your experiences, and when there's questions, if you can answer it, you know, as per your um, particular industry or environment, feel free to speak up, okay? You guys are the experts. I've come to India and learned a lot in the last four days. This is my first time here. I've been, you know, wanting to visit India for about 15 years since I, I started my career. Yeah, I look a little bit young. So I've been wanting to come to India, and I've got to experience a lot, um, like I said, in the last two days of the conference, three days of being here. Now is my chance to share a little bit of the work that I've been doing, not in isolation, but with customers and practitioners and consultants in the industry. And now I can share that with you guys and help you guys build a community around agile practices in highly regulated environments if you haven't already started building that community here, right? All right, well, let's start with just the definition of high assurance. So you can decide, right, you know, after this, if you're in the right room or um, potentially you want to get up and see another talk after this, right? Because I'm not going to get to my agenda until we're 15 minutes in and you're already settled in, okay? So high assurance. High assurance software systems are unique because they must satisfy basic functional service pro properties that the system intends to deliver, okay? As well as guarantee desirable system properties such as security, safety, timeliness, and reliability. Some of the industries that are covered here, and I, I did a little bit of a scan of the crowd to see um, kind of which companies that you guys were working for. But some of the industries that are often um, talked about when we talk, talk about high assurance are um, you know, military and defense, command and control systems, aerospace, um, could be automated manufacturing, could be, be automated banking systems that have uh, high risk. Okay? We we'll also look at things like the development of uh, nuclear power plants. And then the example that I'm going to you know, talk a lot about today is um, the healthcare industry, specifically medical devices. Okay. So I won't, you know, talk about a broad spectrum of industries and I actually um, just give you some examples of regulating bodies that um, you guys have probably heard about whether you develop healthcare products or, um, or whether you just use them in your daily lives. But some examples of regula regulating bodies include um, the FDA, so the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, ISO standards, European Union, or MedDev. Um, there's one here in India, the Drug Controller General of India, that you guys um, are probably familiar with. But um, to my understanding, that's fairly recent as of 2005 and um, is just building their um, standards organization, if you will, or their regulatory organization. Okay. We also have Health Canada. And then, of course, ourselves. We can be harder on ourselves, right, than... Um, than some regula regulatory agencies. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Now, there's also um, organizations like the Global Harmonization Task Force that release guidance documents that combine a lot of the different um, regulations across different regions of the world. Um, 
and start to standardize that as well as the IEC. So although the IEC is not a regulation, it's recognized as a good standard when developing medical instrumentation. So those are a couple of the examples of regulating bodies that we might have if we were to look at this medical device example. Okay, so I'm gonna ask everybody to stand up one more time. Okay, I know, it's terrible, isn't it? Last day of the conference and this guy's got us standing up all the time. Okay, so by the definition that I gave of high assurance, I want you to stay standing if you uh, work either in your daily lives or um, within a company that provides products or services that are delivered in high assurance environments. So stay standing. Wow, everyone? All right, pretty close. Now I'm not encouraging anybody to sit down. Stay standing. Okay, now if you're already using, um, and I'm just gonna use the term agile practices, right? And this isn't, because it's an agile conference. Now, you could call it more advanced software practices. You could call it new software development or lean startup practices or lean practices. So if you're using those things in the development of this high assurance product, stay standing. Okay, so some, a lot of you are already sort of practicing, right? Okay, now if you've read your uh, regulatory guiding documents for your specific industry, whether those are internal, whether they're an FDA document or an ISO document or something else for your industry, stay standing. If you've read those in the last, let's say, if you've read them in the last two years, we'll be pretty lenient. <laughs> All right, we got, we got a couple, yep. If you've read them in the last year, if you've just taken a look at them and, and maybe it's your annual um, New Year's resolution that you're gonna reread those docs, right? Okay, so we got a couple of people standing. Thank you. And these are, yeah, these documents right here. That'll be part of what I'm asking you to do today. You saw a lot of people sat down, right? So one of my asks of you is gonna be that you go back and, and next week or the week after, make a little bit of time and actually understand your regulation. It doesn't matter what your role on the software team is, um, you can't challenge status quo and you, um, you can't de deliver better products if you don't understand what you're actually complying with. So take a minute and go back and read those things. I would set some time aside so you can get a nap in if you need to or <laughs> sleep, actually. The, a lot of them that I've read aren't, aren't actually that bad. They're pretty readable, okay? Now, would you be surprised to, to see this in, with regard to the FDA and medical devices? Although the waterfall model is a useful tool for introducing design controls, its usefulness in practice is limited. For more complex devices, a concurrent engineering model is more representative of the design processes in use in the industry, okay? And that's from an FDA, FDA guidance document that, that dates back to 1997. That's why I say, kind of go back and reread these things. Reread them with a different lens, right? So it's before the signing of the Agile Manifesto even, right? And it's saying, you know, although the waterfall model is useful, you know, there are other methods out there. And you're gonna see that if you look at the guidance and the regulations, um, when I went back and read these things, I would find a number of places at least where you can draw statements out like this, right? Now you have to go back and read it in context to make sure that that's applicable. But things like, it is important to note that neither this document nor CFR 820.30 itself constrains development to single pass stage gated waterfall activities. Or specifically in IEC 62.304 where it states, um, the medical device standard states, these activities and tasks may overlap and interact and may be performed iteratively or recursively. It's not the intent to imply that a waterfall model should be used, okay? Now, like 62.304, yep, okay. Um, so I'm not here to bash the waterfall model and, and like, um, Scott mentioned this morning there, you know, it has it, its place and, and its purpose. What I'm here to, to challenge you is that um, we're not limited or restricted to the waterfall model because we're in um, a high assurance or a regulated environment, okay? I'm here to help dispel the, math, the industry myth that's kind of perpetuated by our own past, right? That we can challenge these things. You know, if we want to and we think that there's a better way um, we can actually challenge the, the status quo. 
oftentimes it's not our regulators who are um, mandating this on us. And if we work closely with our regulating bodies, we can figure out ways to be in harmony and develop better software pro pro practices, if you will, um, Agile being one of those, um, that we can use within our own organization to help with things like um, quality, safety, security. Also to help with innovation and speeding um, our products to market as well. There's no reason we can't take advantage of those things within our own industries. Okay, now that said, I'm gonna ask two things from you today, and um, I've already asked both of them. So one is gonna be that you participate. You guys are the experts. Um, so if there's questions, um, I'm not gonna be shy to ask if anybody else would like to, to field that or has run into it in your uh, industry. One of the things that I've done um, is to help build a little bit of a community where healthcare organizations could actually get on the phone with each other, sit at a round table, not talk about their um, specific um, their specific company and practices, but just talk about best practices for software development within whatever guidelines and regulations. So you guys start to build that community yourselves here as well. And the second thing would be, of course, go back and uh, understand your regulations if you haven't already. Okay, so if I didn't meet you, I, I tried to get around and meet as many people as I could before the room filled in, but I'm Craig Langenfeld, and I've worked with Rally Software now for a, l a little over five years. I've been lucky enough that my background has always included either Agile and Lean or software in it. Okay, so I did some Lean stuff within manufacturing before um, I went and, and started as a software engineer and worked heavily within the software development um, life cycle. And really within regulated environments, I worked with uh, Monsanto, which is a global biotech company. And at Monsanto, I helped to build the document management systems that actually controlled a lot of our regulating documents across, across the world for different regulating agencies. Now, I've been lucky enough to work with a lot of great people in my days. And on this specific project, I've worked closely with Dean Leffingwell. And many of you may know Dean as an author, a methodologist, an executive. He most recently um, came out with his book um, just about a year ago, I think, Agile Software Requirements. Okay, so Dean and I teamed together, not just with ourselves, but with several others. And um, we did come out with a writing or a white paper, if you will, about using Agile practices in uh, high assurance and highly regulated environments. Okay, and we didn't do this in isolation. At Agile 2010, we brought together several of the companies that were coming to me and asking, hey, I know you work with these other companies in our same industry. How are they doing verification and, val and validation? What are they doing now that they're building user stories? What are they doing with their PRDs and SRSs? How is that actually working? Okay. I, said, I don't know the answer to that, right? I know what this company's doing and that company's doing, but I don't know how you come together. So what Dean and I did was to build a community where we could start to share those ideas and come up with some suggested ways. Okay, now you'll have to apply that to your own specific environment. And if I go fast enough, I'll, I'll get a, uh, let you guys have an example um, from a healthcare company that's actually applying some of those practices. So, Everybody's got their waterfall story, right? So everybody here who's practicing Agile remembers the days of waterfall, right? And mine's gonna, I guess, date back to when I initially started as a software engineer working for a large insurance company, the largest home and auto insurer in the US, okay? And of course, this is the proverbial my friend, right? Um, so this is my friend's story, really. My friend was working on a software project where um, it, the, the application was, was going to send out the billing statements to you know, a specific state for a specific line of business, right? And so they were updating this application. And like many of the projects at that uh, you know, specific organization, it was, it was late and it was over budget. And what did we do? We, had, and we followed PMI processes you know, to the T, straight out of the book. Um, and so what did we do? We rushed into testing, right? And we, we, they, so they rushed into testing, right? And what happened was they were able to get it through all these stage gates and into production very quickly, which 
oftentimes didn't happen, but in this case it did. So it got into production, and when the application ran for the first time in production, all the English-speaking policyholders um, that preferred English got their bills in Spanish. All the Spanish-speaking policyholders got their bills in English, and um, we all laughed about it, right? He got a little bit of a, a talking to in that project, of course, um, who had sent out all these paper bills, um, got a little bit of a hand slapping. But the point being is that I think if they were practicing Agile, in fact, you, know, you can be pretty sure that a, a defect that is that big would have never made it out of an iteration, yet alone into a production life cycle. And for the products that we build in the medical device space and in others where um, aircrafts rely on our software to stay in the air and um, nations require our software for defense and humans actually go into medical devices or rely on our tests from uh, the software that those medical devices produce. Those things, I got to think at a minimum, if you were to make a mistake like that, you'd lose your job. Okay? In a worst case, you might actually injure somebody um, or cause some other high risk. Okay? That's why I feel like Agile is important or better software practices um, other than the traditional ways that we, we worked, like the example I just gave. Okay, so where are we going with this? Ah, pow. That's part of the show, too. So where are we going with this? Um, I want to just give you guys a little bit more fodder. Many of you are already practicing Agile and high assurance. So you might run into these things within your organization. People asking questions, people asking if other companies are actually doing this, other organizations are actually practicing this. So I'm going to tell you, um, you know, how Agile is proven within high assurance using that healthcare example. And then I want to talk about four key points, which is you know, a proposed Agile framework. And this isn't something that's prescriptive. You know, this is just a suggested way that I've seen some companies work. Um, the Agile High Assurance Requirements Model, again, they say framework and model, right? It says working with, with Dean, and, and that's what he does, frameworks and models and stuff, right? But these are proposed ways that you could work, and they answer questions or help to start the conversation around what do we do with PRDs and SRSs. Then we have when do we do artifact generation, right? We have verification and validation artifacts. When do we do those things? And lastly, um, an updated QMS system. How's our QMS system intertwined with this and what do we actually um, need to do in terms of updates? So that's where we're going. And then at the end, or close to the end, I'd like to have a, a guest speaker up here to talk about their implementation of Agile within a healthcare environment. Okay, um, so just some case studies. The, the first one I could find, and the first thing you do when you start an effort like this, right, you go out and Google, Agile and FDA, and you go out and, and Google Agile High Assurance, Agile Regulated Environments, all these things. And the case study that kept coming up was one that dates back to, I think the project or the case study was actually like 2004 when Abbott Laboratories compared a traditional project to an, an Agile project. And they actually presented these facts at Agile 2009. Um, but they came up with 20 to 30% fewer defects found, right? We've all heard things like that. Um, but in conclusion, and you have to go out and get the case study yourself and, and read it, but in conclusion, they say, this experience has convinced us that an agile approach is uh, the approach best suited for development of FDA-regulated um, devices. Okay? So that was, was kind of the first one I could kind of find. A more recent example um, would be GE Healthcare. In a Dr. Dobbs article, GE Healthcare Goes Agile, um, that was submitted um, or published, I guess, in 2010. Okay. And in that, in conclusion of that, and they give a lot of examples within um, this publication of, of things to watch out for and things that maybe didn't quite fit quite right. Um, so it's a good article because I, I think it's just really transparent. Um, but even in conclusion, um, Andy Deitch, and, and just to give you some context, they, I, I was familiar with this because I um, worked with GE Healthcare a bit. There's probably some GE Healthcare folks in the room because I have a large contingency and India and Israel, um, in Europe, and then as well in the US. So this was a global uh, Agile initiative within their imaging solutions group. It's, it's since went broader. But Andy uh, Deitch, their VP of engineering, says we're making progress and, and feel the benefits that our Agile adoption have been worth the effort. Because of this, we're rolling out Agile um, globally within GE Healthcare. 
Okay, so it's not a real bold statement, but if you actually read, you'll see some evidence of you know some of the struggles that Andy went through, and and they believed that was a better way, even within a regulated environment, to deliver software. Okay, and then you could use this example from the U.S. Department of Defense, right? Who held their first ever um, Agile conference? So it's hit the government, but uh, you could, if you guys were here this morning, um, Evan Liborn, if I have his name right. Um, spoke about how the Australian government and using Agile within um, the Australian government as well. So Evan's here at the, the conference and actually had a chance um, to work with Agile within um, a very Prince2 environment within the Australian government. And an interesting fact that he noted was that Agile project actually won an award over the Prince2 projects, right? And then there's white papers and references. Um, so a very good reference that's going to come out that um, I read, which I think is going to be the final draft, Mike Russell's in the back of the room and has been heavily involved in this, um, is the Association for Advancement of Medical Instrumentation. And they're going to um, be publishing soon, I think in the next month or two, a technical information report. Okay? And it's entitled, Guidance on the Use of Agile Practices in the Development of Medical Device Software. Um, there was contributors from all sorts of healthcare companies as well as FDA auditors and so forth on this kind of 90 page reference. And it does a really good job of blending what Agile's principles are with, um, <clears throat> with uh, what the healthcare regulations are. Okay, so that will be coming out soon. I would write that down and check out their website if you're not a member, that would be a great uh, reference to get. And they make a statement as well, <clears throat> since Agile is a highly incremental and evolutionary approach, it can therefore be mistakenly assumed that Agile is incompatible with the expectations of the medical device software process. And they draw out several examples, as, as I mentioned, so I would look at that. And then we have any number of blogs that are popping up. And Scott, yours is one of the first ones that I saw. Um, and you'll, you know, I'm squeezed in, in between Scott Ambler today. And so he has the, his Agile uh, scaling model um, talks a little bit about um, regulatory, or using Agile in regulatory environments. Tom Grant from Forrester did a whole series on it last year. Um, he gets a chance to talk to a number of companies, as well as Dean Leffingwell, who I mentioned already. If you go out to his scaling software agility blog, <clears throat> you'll see a whole series of about 30 posts on Agile in regulated environments. Okay? So is that... Proof, I guess, some, some case studies, some places that you guys can go. Um, it is being used, right? And we can, we can say that we've crossed the chasm or Agile's hit mainstream. And oftentimes um, we'll say that when it actually hits these more complex environments like that, um, that it's actually being used on a broader scale. Why is that? Why in the last couple of years have we really seen a lot of people try to tackle this and, and um, seen all these reference materials and... We see big companies um, that are creating these complex and uh, high-risk devices using Agile software for the same reasons that everyone wants to look at better ways to deliver software, right? And when we look at Agile, it provides just a better working environment in a more collaborative culture, better morale, right? Productivity, time to market is huge right now in this environment. So people want to take advantage of those um, benefits that allow them to get to market quicker and time to market. Now, the main one is quality, right? We've all experienced, hopefully, better quality in our products. Maybe some of you haven't, but um, there are many principles within Agile that just inherently um, provide us with better quality, right? So this is an example, you know, Agile does drive quality, safety, and efficacy. And some of the things like setting up a CI environment, um, looking at automated testing, um, the user story itself, which I'll go over um, a little bit deeper into the presentation. Okay. So let's look at these kind of the four points that I had mentioned earlier. Agile, high assurance, life cycle, framework, if you will. So why do we need anything different than what we already have? Okay, doesn't Agile already, you know, isn't it, don't we just do it within our engineering teams? Why do we need um, to work differently? Because, and I, I hear this, right, with some engineering teams that are kind of working under the radar. Why do we need to do anything different? They can do their regulatory stuff and we'll do our Agile stuff, right? 
But it is different, right? It has additional requirements when you're, when you're within a regulated environment, okay? Those, and this comes from uh, an FDA guidance, and who wouldn't think it's apply, implying waterfall, right, with a graphic like this? Okay, but you'll see those two words, verification and validation. That came up all the time for me. And verification, you know, when put simply, you built it right, and validation is you built the right thing, right? Verification provides objective evidence that design outputs of a particular phase of the software development uh, life cycle meet all of the specified requirements of that phase, okay? Verification, design outputs meet the requirements of that phase. Validation, confirmation that our product meets the in intended use of the system, right? Includes evidence that all software requirements have been implemented correctly, completely, and are traceable to the system requirements. Okay, I apologize for reading that. That's not something that I'm gonna memorize for sure. But that's verification and validation. And one of the questions that I often got is how does that play in? And in addition to that, we have things that regulations um, either strongly suggest us to create or just straight out mandate, you have to have a systems, uh, systems requirements, right? You have to have a traceability, if you wanna say matrix. But really we have to provide requirement specifications and we have to make sure that um, those are traceable. Okay, and there's different ways to do that. I'll give you guys an example. Let's first look at kinda just the, what you guys have probably seen is the Agile framework or the Scrum framework, okay? What does that have in it that actually um, works very well? And this is, teams can do this pretty well when they get started if they're kind of, if they're doing it under the radar or not. Um, they actually can comply with a lot of regulatory things just by doing an iteration because it fits very well with things like verification. Okay, what do we have on an iteration that um, makes this good? Well, we have an iteration backlog which is our inputs. In that iteration backlog, we have these things called user stories. User stories, if we're doing this correctly, right, have a very strict definition of done. They also have acceptance criteria hanging off them, okay? So the acceptance criteria is gonna become the verify piece of this, right? The definition of done is gonna include those items that we need um, to actually exit or get the output from the sprint. That can include things like, you know, updating re regulatory artifacts if we need to. When we enter the sprint, we're in this constant define build and verify cycle, okay? And every day we're updating our user stories, we're running our uh, actual test cases, and those things become very traceable items. If we use automated systems, you can uh, sometimes set up a sophisticated system that'll allow you to automate this stuff, right? From code, or being able to trace down to your uh, code, being able to trace to your test cases, so forth. Define, build, verify, okay? At the end, um, we're not only going to deliver output, but we're also um, going to add an additional step, which is, uh, you know, the, the demo at the end. So you're going to let allow your business stakeholders or actual proxies for your product to view what you've actually built. So you can get eyes on it early. Let's scale that to an agile uh, project life cycle. So like I said, the verification iteration was something um, that I often seen teams be able to implement and be pretty successful with it. It was when did we do validation though in the validation activities? Because we can't keep up with all the validation stuff during our daily sprint, especially if we're just starting as an agile team and a lot of those things are manual, right? So when do we actually do these things and don't we need to do it every sprint because a sprint is a phase, right? An iteration is a phase, okay? And what, what I found is the best way is actually, you are gonna have to accept that if you're kicking off a, a new project in an environment like this, you're gonna have some additional planning, some additional analysis. You might have to do some work on your quality management system. You might have to set up some additional architecture, okay? You might do requirements definitions like create PRDs and um, break those into SRSs up front, right? We're gonna accept that. We're not gonna say we're just gonna get started. Then we would move into verification iterations, and that's the iteration I just explained in that iteration framework, where it allows us to be very traceable. But at the end, um, what I found is a, a lot of the uh, organizations that I worked with, at the end they would verify, 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 so we did three iterations, was highly traceable, and at the end we'd have some big lump of scope, right? All these artifacts that needed to be updated. They didn't blend 
any of their QMS really um, with their actual Agile teams. And the complaint I heard was, yeah, we're very predictable during our verification iterations or our regular sprints, right? But when we get to the end, we have no idea how long it's going to take us to get this thing validated so we can get some system increment into an environment that, you know, the FDA is blessed, if you will. And what I saw was those organizations come back and then try to address that um, particular issue with validation sprints. And they might have any number, you know, I've, I've seen three and four validation sprints. So it still takes two months at the end to go through validation. But by chopping it up into sprints, we retrospect every two weeks and we decide if the things that we are doing are valuable. Okay, and we try to pull that forward so we become predictable. If we know it takes four validation sprints, maybe we try to get it down to three and try to get it down to two um, so we don't have this huge pile of scope and we're unpredictable at the end. And throughout this life cycle then, we're working on continuous verification, validation activities. This has to be driven in tandem with our quality management system. Right? We can't do this separate from our quality management system. And when we scale this, Okay. If you're familiar with Dean, his big picture um, model is one that he often used to explain how to scale to a complex organization. And I know that in many of your environments, you're creating products that take teams of teams and programs and entire portfolios, entire organizations to build, right? So he uses this model to explain it. And it might be hard to see from the back. But some of the things that are important when we looked at this in the context of high assurances. Um, although you have architectural governance that sits above um, the, the program, maybe at the portfolio or organizational level, you also need your compliance activities okay, or your regulating body. You need those to work in an agile life cycle as well. So you need, they need to be educated on what the teams are doing. And the updating their quality management system, they need to do that in tandem. Now, those people... It's got to be a cross-functional team where you have team members that are actually working within that system, working with the compliance team, and vice versa. Those people have to funnel down into the actual teams, similar to how an architect would work. Now, you also have at the, um, at the release level or program level, you have PRDs, right? So the big scary thing for a lot of organizations was... Yeah, we do Agile within these little increments, but what do we do because we, we then go outside of Agile and create a PRD and SRS document, okay? So what we you know, suggested was, hey, you're still going to create your product requirements document. You just might not do it to the same level of detail. You're going to do it to the detail that's needed um, to kick off this particular phase of the project. And then the teams will work on the SRSs, which will eventually be broken, or system requirements which will be broken into the user stories that the teams will work on in the sprints. And you'll have a system increment, which is a validation increment. Okay, now the input, so going from that big picture model back to kind of the input of an individual iteration. I talked about this. It's still a user story, at least in our context. Okay. Others, might, others might use different artifacts, but a user story at a minimum is just a story card, right, which is pretty scary, especially in a regulated environment. But it offers two pretty valuable properties, which are the definition of done and acceptance criteria, okay? And so those two, acceptance criteria and the definition of done can help drive that input. And you could also add other things to a user story if you needed to for your environment. Yep, question? You're gonna, yep, you're gonna have a definition of done um, and you're gonna revise that definition of done for each sprint, right? And all the stories have to um, meet that definition of done criteria. It's for the sprint that each user, so that, that graphic is probably, um, yep. Okay, so the question was, is the definition of done specific to each user story or specific to a sprint? And definition of done typically is specific to a sprint, right? And then you're gonna iterate on that definition of done. That will include those regulatory things. Okay. Now, a user story is really good because, like I said, it's got good traceability. And I mentioned this before, but a user story can trace via the task down to the code level and even down to the unit uh, test level if you want. And a user story can trace to the acceptance test. So it creates a lot of traceability within the iteration that can then scale up beyond iterations into validation. 
Okay, we don't want to let those, you know, one of, like I said, one of the, the things that I often heard was, hey, we're using user stories on the Agile teams, and then um, when we get to regulatory or validation claims, we're going back to our traditional PRDs and SRSs, and we're doing a lot of manual manipulation. Okay, well, in an advanced environment, hopefully that your user stories, because a user story is good. It's not what you plan to build six months ago. It's not a requirement that says, hey, we plan to build this six months ago. User story is actually what you built, right? It's, it is the detail of what went into what you built. And if you can get that to then trace back up to your system requirement, which traces up to your um, product requirement, you can build those documents then, or even have those documents automated um, based on what you actually built, okay? And it will fill that definition in as you go. Okay, so if you don't want to change the labels in the product requirements doc, might be called a marketing document or, or a system intent, um, don't feel like you have to shock your organization and change those things. You might just start to uh, change the way that you produce them. And then if you go out to the Scaling Software Agility blog, you can see um, some kind of more detailed requirements models out there. So I won't go into those in specific detail. Now, the quality management system, and I'm certainly no quality management system expert. This comes from um, a friend of mine at Omnix, which is a, a joint venture with GE and the University of Pittsburgh. And what he said in terms of consideration for your quality management system, and I saw this across the board, right? You have to involve the folks that are actually creating and maintaining your quality management system in your Agile initiative, okay? And... We have, you have to look, is this, a, is this something that we can iterate on or is, is it a rewrite? Is it an opportunity for us to um, rewrite our quality management system? Okay. You have to establish that quality management system cross-functional team. Okay. So you have to have people that are actually uh, working within the framework of that system, sitting on the team and people sitting on the, call, the, on the team and people sitting on the, call, the uh, compliance team that are creating that system, sitting down with the actual teams that are using it. Treat it like a product. Run releases and sprints on your QMS system um, just like you would any other product and iterate on it, improve on it, make it better. Okay. And then my last point was um, a lot of questions about what actually happens in the validation sprint. Okay. We, got, we got the picture on the verification sprint and you're kind of asking us to move some things out of that so we don't weigh ourselves down with those two week iterations. But when do we do the validation activities that, that we're used to doing and that we need to do, right, to comply? And so I know you can't read through uh, each one of these, but moving those activities out into the validation sprint to anything from updating traceability matrices. And like I said, automation is your friend when you get into a very fast moving environment like this, but updating traceability matrices like PRD to SRS and product requirements doc to feature tests um, down to the code and so, so forth. Any documentation that you need to update. So um, you have to allow yourself time to actually, if you need to manually generate that and to uh, have sign offs and get it into the appropriate system, that's what the validation um, sprint is there for. Okay. Now, as you, um, the first time that you go through this, like I said, you may have several validation sprints until you can work on understanding and work with your auditors on understanding what is actually required and you can start to get the right set of um, documents versus just giving them everything that you have in the past. Okay, so I'm seeing some yawns out there, so I'm going to invite my guest speaker up and, and change it up a little bit. But Matt Anderson, who has contributed a lot to this conference, and so I appreciate him being willing to just step up at the last minute. I got a mic up here for you, Matt. Um, I appreciate him being able to step up and um, give you guys an example of how Cerner Healthcare um, was able to implement Agile within a highly regulated environment. Yeah, and I'll say that looking at the slides, there's some things we do differently. Right, but, and feel free to stop me as you kind of look at uh, what we're going through. So go ahead and go on to the next slide here. So when we look at our quality process, our QSM process, we call it method Q, method quality, or we also call it SLIM, right, because we're trying to say it's an agile process. We actually, as part of our agile rollout, spent a significant amount of time making sure we had a quality process that worked with the agile environment. 
So when we looked at the FDA requirements and we worked with them, what we realized is what the FDA wants is sign-offs at the release level. They want us to validate when we are sending software out, that's when most of your signatures and most of your artifacts have to be in place. So what that enabled us to do is say, you know what, let's talk about what we intend to do at a high level. And we showed them our roadmaps, we showed them kind of our epic level stories. Uh, those of us that know Cerner, we don't like to say epic because that's our chief competitor, so we use capability instead. Uh, but so we use these capabilities and some of the acceptance criteria that are based on that to meet our high level requirements to say, hey, we're not coding in a vacuum. We know what we're going to be doing, but we don't know it in such detail that I have to have a detailed requirements document already in place. Then we move into our iteration phase and we do our user stories and we'll have some uh, future stories on that. And then just before final release, we do a final design input signature which is our final system level requirements document that's been updated. And then we do our final design output signature, which is all of the artifacts that are produced by the coding system, including our code reviews and what have you. The key is when we are going through our iterations, we are updating a solution level or system level document as opposed to my individual user story or I'm creating a document per project. The FDA actually does not want a project docu level documentation. They only want a system level documentation. And for us, that was a big area where we were stumbling all the way along. And now we realized, hey, at system level, that gives us a little bit more flexibility. So when we do any work, we look at everything as a change record. We have release change records. So we would sign off our design input at this release CR level. We would then go down, and when we're going to release, we sign off again, design input, design output, and you'll see the various things that we would have there, solution level requirements, our traceability matrix, whatever we choose that to be, those are all included in those. If we go on and look at what we do during the iteration, our initial design input is those user stories, and because we have that acceptance criteria on those user stories, maybe we have some visual design mock-ups that go with it, that shows us, again, the intent for the change record that we're working on. And then we would break down the tasks for our user stories, and I teach this in our classes. I don't want to see, and most electronic tools have the templates that allow you to quickly break out tasks, and almost everybody immediately goes into, well, I got requirements and design and coding and, and whatever. When I talk to my teams, I'm like, that doesn't help us, right? Tell me what you're gonna do and then one of the tasks that I want at the end, I don't want to see a create or write requirements. I want to see update requirements. And I want it to be one of the last ones we do, because all we're doing is we use the user story for all that conversation that we want to take place. And then one of our final tasks is, let's just go update that requirement at the end with what we actually did. Not necessarily what we intended to do, so we get rid of the marking things as future and tagging something that's not quite done yet, something along those lines but we update that requirement and we sign off on that CR as, as we are ready for it to release. So we do it incrementally every single time. With that in mind, you might have kind of a hierarchy of CRs. And so I can have a release CR way up top, which is again where our final signatures and that's where we expect to be audited. But I can have these children CRs and they can even have children, grandchildren, so on and so forth. And kind of the philosophy behind it is my parent, if I've signed off on it, can actually, that can serve as the d initial design input for any of the children. And from a traceability standpoint, as we've worked with the FDA, they've been fine with this. The big thing is, is anytime we have a capability, right, something that we're considering to be big and epic or what have you, it's releasable. So each one of those CRs, they have to be able to stand by themselves and they cannot span releases, right? If I have to try and span releases, I create a new change record, and we go from there. Questions? Yes. So, like, normally the user stories, right? User stories, uh, and so uh, one question uh, I'm having is like, how you map the user story to the solution level design document? Because you said you are doing agile development. Yep. So we are to break entire CR into a various iterations, and uh, one iteration will have a couple of user stories. Yes. And say if I, one iteration is having five user stories, one user story may need an updation on the solution document, but rest for not. Yep. So what was that the task done at the developer level or who is owning that? Because 
so, those two things. Yeah, so what we have is we have a tool um, that we actually do our electronic signatures in. And when we do those electronic signatures, we note what the change records are. And for us, we we'll note the user story numbers. Here's all the user stories that we reviewed with this. Yep. And, and we attach the updated system level document or a link to the updated system level document, depending on what tool we're using. Right, so it's just a, a one-stop shop for all of our uh, traceability and every, every artifact we need to have. And it's a, it has a single record. And when the auditor comes in, we're like, here you go. We'll go look at this, and you can see this project from start to finish. No, it's part of the development team. So the whole development team, and that's part of our definition of done, you have to include all of these things. Right. Now, is that heavier than your standard Agile? Yeah. But it's not that much heavier. And one of the things that we talked about yesterday was just the have, making sure that that's versioned, right, and allowing yourself to update that and know that we're going to update it and continually update it. And one of the challenges we have, we actually tried to go just using user stories, and the challenge we have is what happens when I have a future story that invalidates a past story, right? And if I go with just user stories, that doesn't quite work for us. But with the systems level requirements document, I can still handle that scenario. Because again, when you get audited, it's always point in time. What was your process at that point in time? And what were you developing at that point in time to produce code? So you created all the PRs from the system requirements from the PRs? Typically, it, it, from neither, actually. It really comes from our roadmap, right? We determine what we are going to do, and we decompose that work down. And then we'll sign off, we'll create the CRs based on what we expect to be the releasable components. So again, we, we really want to go from vision to roadmap, down to re the release planning, down to the iteration planning. We let that flow through and just our release plans are what are the capabilities we plan to release and those are our change records. And then we bundle it up under a parent for our auditing purposes. So uh, do you uh, say that just doing upward planning not just depending on the requirements of the development and what I say is our focus has requirements of the So repeat that again, I want to make sure I understood it. If you're in a regular environment, you cannot get away from documentation. But what you can get away from is how detailed the documentation is. So for our, I'll just share our experience. We used to document down to, in our requirements, things like all the system shell, make sure that all required fields are bolded and highlighted in yellow before you populate them, and then they stay bolded and have different color, whatever, after the fact. And we would list that for each and every field, right? So when I'm audited, I'm going to have struggles to make sure, oh, if I missed one, how would I get through, down to that? Well, now we've pulled it up a level and said, okay, the system shall honor required fields. How we choose to do that is up to us, right? But we're going to make sure that it, it meets our usability standards and whatever our guidelines are, and we can be audited at our guideline level. And so it keeps it at a much higher level as opposed to getting down into the weeds. No. Because we're doing a sign-off at the end, it's not fixed. And that's the beauty of the fix. The, so what I can say is, we plan to do these five. Guess what? The one over there on the far right didn't get done. We just pull it out, and when our final design input signature is done, it has what we actually did, not what we intended to do. So is it a fixed time at the event? Is it a release, you know, three months, two months, six months? How do you define it? <laughs> Yeah, so I'd say my answer is going to be the Agile, it depends. Um, we have 140 plus teams, so I can't say the definitively what it is. Most of our teams try and fix, uh, release on a monthly basis. Um, we do have some that release like every six months, um, and others that release every two to three weeks. And so what they define as release, we just are giving them a pattern of here's how you need to follow it, but make sure when you sign off your design input at the end, it's what you did, not what you intended to do. Okay, so that's why we, love, we like these parent-child CRs. So I can have a parent CR and then have a child CR for each team that spans off of it. Because in reality, we're get, we have to release the thing together. And we have to make sure that when we release software that works, all the teams do their job. 
Now, if I have the middle one and one team gets done and the other one doesn't get done, guess what? We pull it out. It's not in that release. We move it into the next release. Yeah, but we also tend to assign an owner. So one team is the one that's responsible overall for the project that we're working on, and the other teams are supplementary to add into it. But if they have their own artifacts, we expect them to have change records for those artifacts. All right, back to you. Okay. All right, thank you, Matt. Yep. And as Matt mentioned, right, we use the words framework and model, right? But I don't know if there is a framework and model um, for the way that you do this stuff. Just trying to inspire some, some thought that you can go back and, and challenge status quo, right? So um, anything that you might do in one industry or one particular organization probably isn't going to equate directly to another organization, but trying to share ideas so that we can take those things back and challenge our own status quo. So appreciate you coming up and sharing that, Matt. Okay, just in closing, a couple of key points to remember is, you know, agile extremism does not help in this case. It doesn't help to really say, well, you know, as an engineering team, it's working software over documentation, so we don't have to do this, right? We've went to agile, we don't have to do this. So that's not helpful. You do have documentation. You do have to comply with regulations. If your products get pulled off the shelf or... Um, you know, you get your executive team in trouble because you didn't comply with something and now there's a risk in your product, right? Um, that isn't going to help anyone, right? Agile or, uh, yeah, Agile and most regulating bodies are not at odds. And that's where I had mentioned if you go actually take a look at the, the regulations themselves or read the guidelines, you'll see that um, most regulating bodies aren't at odds with Agile. And we can play very well together. And one of the things that we can get that we can do is get to know your your regulators, right? Make sure that you go to them and ask them questions if you're transitioning to a different process to make sure that you're satisfying them um, first of all. And like I said, make sure that you're satisfying this person first. You need to um, satisfy compliance while preserving as much and injecting as much agility and innovation into your process as you can. And make sure to implement the appropriate degree of rigor um, as needed by your product or what you're building in your environment. Okay, I've seen an organization um, that had their internal IT organization building or implementing an ERP system that was holding themselves to a greater degree of rigor um, than their product side that was actually building um, CAT scan machines, right? And that internal IT function um, was holding themselves to a very high degree of rigor. So make sure that you're implementing the appropriate degree of rigor um, for what you need. Okay. And in closing, I think you know, my point is pretty clear that I feel and have seen Agile being used in many of these highly regulated environments, especially within healthcare. So as I mentioned, you know, I challenge you guys all to go back, take a look at your own environments and see if there are um, ways that you can inject some of the practices that you learned at the conference here um, into your own environment. And just a, a quick statement from Tom Grant of the Forrester Group. Um, like I said, he did a blog series last year and did a lot of research on this, has done some speaking on the topic, and he says, you know, Agile isn't just good for high assurance development. It's better than traditional methods. So thank you for attending. I think, are we right at the time box? Because we'll take questions if we can. If not, I'd be happy to kind of move toward the back.